so much. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as you quite rightly say, um, our guest, singer, musician, human rights activist, needs absolutely no introduction. But I will just do one fanboy thing. Thank you for one word. I mean, I don't care about sex, and all that. But Woe Man Wo Wo made a huge difference, actually, to the world. Now, uh, Peter needs no introduction, but to be frank, I might. Um, and I will just say one word. Um, on a day when the Prime Minister is demonstrating that actually you can do anything at any age you like, and I'll come back to Mr. Cameron, or Lord Cameron, and then you will now be. Um, I guess part of my reason for being here is that, uh, as you kindly said, uh, Sky brought me out of um, the cold store to host its Sunday morning political interview show, which only 15 people uh, have done in the whole of my working life across the three main channels, ITV, BBC, and Sky. And there was a little bit of um, interest when I took over the show earlier on this autumn because I was the first person of colour. But I think actually what it turns out, and I only realised this this weekend when I was thinking about this session, that actually what is actually far more interesting and possibly most important, more important, is that I am by about 15 years the oldest person ever to start that gig um, in, in television. Um, Dave Frost was 15 years younger, and he was ancient already when he started on BBC. Um, and I think it's, uh, it tells us something about the possibilities in our minds about creativity that uh, Sky took the risk. Now, by Christmas time, actually, they may have sacked me and all of this has gone wrong, but for the moment it's going well. So let me start uh, by asking you, Peter. I mean, you've never stopped, actually, uh, for what now? 50 something years, uh, producing what the public recognizes as a flow of creative work. Um, most of us think that that's sort of what you do, that's what people do. Let me start in an, uh, perhaps in an uncomfortable place. Had it ever occurred to you to stop, that you could run out of creativity? Yeah, I think you often part of the creative process is you either think you're creating the best thing that's ever been invented or you think it's a pile of shit. <laughs> and uh, that's part of the process. And when you, when you uh, I think, you struggle with, with what I think is the role of courage or the role of fear, which we all encounter regularly. Sometimes you can measure some. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and for sure you had doubts and fears of this world, but um, you know, I can't do anything else very well, so uh, just carries on and I just follow the things that interest me. I doubt if it's true that you can't do other things very well. You seem to. Uh, turn most of what you've done into some sort of goal, including business. But um, let's talk about courage and fear. Let's start with fear. Uh, I know that one of the things that uh, you've, you've been thinking about is the extent to which, sorry, the extent to which fear becomes, uh, if you like, a, an albatross around the neck of creativity. Uh, is that something that you've experienced? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, just recently, you know, I was trying to do a tour and involve contemporary artists. And so that meant how going out hustling, which is something I've done throughout my life, um, and trying to persuade contemporary artists that they should work with me. And once again, it opened up the possibilities of rejection. And I think, uh, you know, we all know this and feel it. And a lot of people suffering with prostitutes. And for sure, there were people that really didn't want to work with But there were some that did. And I think, yeah, we often come across these moments. I, I do think we're at a particularly interesting moment in time because, uh, as we heard from 
Marcus was saying and Brian earlier. Um, AI is the way they, I, th I think it's like a hurricane. I think the way that we live now is going to be totally transformed. And in the way that we expect big, strong trees to survive the hurricane, they're actually the ones that fall over, they get knocked over, and it's the, the saplings that are flexible and adaptable um, that seem to survive. So I think it's a huge creative opportunity that's coming, but it's also going to uh, knock over a lot of things, and, uh, and there will be a lot of fear associated with it. But I think we have no choice but to jump into it and, and grab it find ways to work with them. Um, and these sort of youthful traits, you know, I'm interested in this idea of neoteny, of trying to retain what is useful. So, you know, Picasso said it takes a life to learn to be a child, but, but we, we actually try and find what it is in ourselves, <coughs> childlike, and how can we maximize it and get the sense of play. And we've just been put in the best playpen has ever been created you know, through AI. Just, just what we can do visually or with music. And so I think if we can learn not to be afraid of it, but to uh, collaborate with it, we have a much better chance. Well, part of the, the, the theme you've just been talking about then is this the idea of courage. Now, um, I think for lots of us, confronted with an opportunity, um, the first question, if you're honest with yourself, often, is, uh, can I do this? I mean, unless you're a complete, sort of, the person who thinks that they can be world king and blah, 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 all that. But most of us are not idiots. Uh, one of the things that you think about is, can I do this, or will I fall flat on my face? What gives you courage? Um, I think it's an experience of having fallen on my face many times and in fact um, I did this Erhard seminar training in the 80s which is quite interesting because they sort of try to destroy you and then allow yourself to rebuild yourself but what often happened is that people started screwing up things they were very confident and competent so for me my experience I mean as a an Olympic skater I started Falling down, and I've never been really on stage, um, and that was, I think, a fear. And I had one night when we were playing with Frank Zappa, and Zappa's audience, they really didn't like me. And it wasn't just the music; it was personal. You know, I had it was in Germany, English as Scheiße, go home. I was getting beer bottles, and I tried every trick I knew in the book. And uh, it was um, completely unsuccessful. Um, so I did my last, my last card was to play this song very quiet, uh, Here Comes the Flood. And it didn't make any difference. The, the booing got loud. And, uh, and I just stopped. So the next night, I was with my audience again. And I started, I told them what had happened there. Started the song where I had to stop it the previous night. The third night, we were back with Zappa's audience again. And um, it started happening again. You know, they, they really didn't like the booze started rising. And then I started laughing and giggling because I realized that actually the thing I've been most afraid of is the performance that happened to me. And I was still doing what I love to do. And the rest of the band thought I cracked. You know, <laughs> um, but I realized, you know, I've been through my fear and come out the other side. So I, I guess that's the only thing I would say to people is, is when you come up to that point, um, just ride the wave um, to the other side. That's a, I mean, that's a very, uh, it's an inspiring story, but let, let me just equate okay, one thing. On the third night, as you would have stood in the wings, thinking, oh, here we go again, 
What made you walk on? You don't have to, you're Peter Gabriel. I still want to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Yeah, no, no, but I think, yeah, you just, I think a lot of this stuff, you know, we're talking about creativity and longevity, it's just getting the nudges in place that will, because, you know, we, we all have a part of ourselves that uh, wants to veg out on the sofa. And um, it's just, can you get the nudges in place and out of think about machine learning and uh, um, generative models and all of that, which provide, if you like, some new tools which, with which we're unfamiliar. Now, what you were saying uh, a moment ago is that we can do something with this, and this can add to, to us. Now, one of the things I think is difficult as you get older about dealing with any new tool is the fact that, especially if you've been successful, the tendency to say, we've done it like this and it's worked, and that's why I am here, yeah. don't give me all this new stuff. How, but you, you I was going to say notoriously, let's say famously, have, con have been constantly reinventing uh, your music, you've constantly mapped out new paths. I mean, other musicians uh, will say, uh, and I'm not flattering you, it's just the fact that Peter Gabriel is somebody we're always looking at, that's why you were on the, you were on the Time 100 most influential list and all of that. What is it that is in your mind that allows you to be, as you were saying earlier on, flexible, the, the sapling rather than the tree that gets knocked over? Well, I'm a bit of both, probably. I just want to encourage the sampling. And I think my dad was an inventor. And what is fascinating to me is that the distance, uh, I mean, this whole world is accelerating enormously, but the distance between uh, thinking of something and it arriving is something that's made is just collapsing. And already the University of Texas has a program that takes MRI readout in terms of directly into text and Berkeley, they're doing that, they're reading music from the brain. Um, and uh, in Jack Gallant's lab, they're turning uh, MRI packets into video and they train people watching two weeks of video for each frame of video, they uh, record the brain map so that then you could watch people's thoughts and uh, read them translate them into video. Now this is going to mean that the distance between thinking about something and actually making it is going to go to seconds. You know, you're going to have 3D objects that you can think about and will appear. You know, we have the technology now to do that. 
So for all creative activity, that means there's, there shouldn't be any barrier between what you think about and what materializes. And you know, part of my mission, I think, is to convince everyone that they're artists, that these are just, there's no barrier to entry. These are just languages open to all of us. You know, I think you could be dropped into any country uh, and if the only mode of communication was painting, uh, and you were told that within a year, if you couldn't communicate and learn that language of painting, um, you, you would be shot. Now I think if you, your survival is dependent on it, you would learn how to paint. And uh, so, with that in mind, you know, all of the arts should be open and active and. You know, we have um, evidence that if you learn an instrument, there's a, you can see the part of the brain changes its shape. So I think it's clear that, that so all activities, but particularly creative activities, where there's a new step, where the surprise and that is an element, um, they will expand and I think keep our brains functioning well. But it's a whole new world we're just entering, and I think we, we have a choice. We either try and stop it, like Luddites, which I think is futile, or we jump in the waves and uh, wave goodbye to King Canute. Um, let's think practically now. Um, you have this very positive attitude towards the future, towards the possible. Um, I don't think that that it may be in your nature, it may be characteristic, but most of the time, most of us learn as we get older that we have habits that encourage us in one direction or another. Um, what would you say of, if you like, let's, let's say two, two Peter Gabriel habits of thinking or being or behaving that, if you like, um, encourage that kind of positive attitude? Prepared to be uncomfortable and put yourself in situations that, that aren't as, as comfortable as you anticipated. And then, but it's that um, foreign environment in which you don't have all the habits and controls that you learn from. Um, we were working on an idea for you know, this mixture of science and art, which I think is, is happening now very fast. We were trying to get an experience park in the 80s, and Barcelona were the only city crazy enough to take us seriously. But the thought was that in life, you know, it's meaningful, difficult experiences that give us some sense of who we are and hopefully some sense of wisdom. So we ought to have in the creative arts now tools to accelerate or simulate this. These meaningful experiences in a way that could um, get us to a point of wisdom. And I think, you know, as has been said earlier, between Black Brown, the existential crisis we're now in, particularly with the climate, and if we don't find ways of, of uh, connecting to nature, to the planet, and uh, uh, that we have every chance of, of uh, destroying ourselves, I am an optimist. But I, I, I read a long time ago that um, optimists get no done, but pessimists are not in touch with reality. So I, I try to be a realistic optimist. Yeah, I'm a half half for that. Okay, but the, these are two old geezers who spend their lives uh, with people going, time to rap, um, and, and, and doing it religiously. But I just want to ask you one, one last question. Um, last month, Elon Musk said uh, that he thinks that AI will get us to a place where nobody has to work or work is a the, the decision to work is a, is a choice. Um, now let's aim off for everybody's opinion about Elon Musk and whether he's crazy or not, but I think it's an interesting proposition. I mean, people have been saying this for a few centuries, never true, but let's, let's suppose that there's some truth in it that 
we move to a place, as you were saying, where things can be done more uh, readily uh, without labor, and that in a sense, creativity becomes much more, if you like, the normal mode of human, of daily human activity. Yeah. Um, will that be a good thing? Or let me not put it another way. Can we make that a good thing for everybody? Well, uh, it's an in interesting question, and I think also something for longevity, because it, it is going to be like most healthcare. Is youth only going to be available for eternal youth to the wealthy? That's a question for society. Um, but it, for creativity, you know, if it's suddenly there for everyone, it's part of our daily diet. Uh, I think that is something that will s help sustain us, help connect us to our community. I only have to look at the drum circle of them to see that actually works. And, um, and I think maybe help us stay in our bodies and, and maybe better prioritize what, uh, what we value. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Gabriel.